Thanks a lot for the for the invitation to um, to give an overview on the APDD to this meeting. And again, my apologies for coming late. I did not realize that I would delay even the start of the of the session. So uh, I will go a bit through uh, what we have included in the proposal for the APDD, but also some other considerations that uh, were part of our impact assessment and which have links to some of the other issues that will be um, discussed. So. To enter directly then into the into the substance, so I, I think everybody is now uh, well aware of, of the package that of the legislative package that the Commission adopted uh, in November last year, the Clean Energy Package, uh, which has uh, three main themes on energy efficiency, on leadership in renewables, and then on putting consumers at the centre of the energy system, and which needs to be seen really in the context of the implementation of the of the Paris Agreement. It is also this package, the opportunity to uh, use the energy system, use the different energy policies to adapt to uh, societal challenges, to stimulate the economy, and to also adapt to, to uh, changes uh, in terms of digitization of the energy system and of buildings. So there is a big effort not only to meet uh, the, the goals of, of the Paris Agreement, but also to modernize the different pieces of legislation and to integrate them better into the energy system uh, because this package also needs to be seen in the context of the energy union, the different um, legislative framework that has to do with market design at the wholesale level, retail level, and that's why it comes as an, as an overall uh, package with quite a lot of new uh, legislation in it. But it's not only about legislation, so together with the package there is also an effort to work on what we call these enabling measures which uh, have an immediate and, and medium-term application. So they have to do with uh, skills, with innovation, but they also have to do with finance. And in relation to buildings, it's important to mention also the initiative that we have launched on Smart Finance for Smart Buildings, which wants to accompany the additional effort that we put into building renovation. So what was the analysis um, that underpinned our proposals on energy efficiency? So already in 2014, we analyzed uh, what would be our contribution in a communication, our contribution to a new framework uh, post-2020, and there were three main areas that we had identified that needed additional action. One, it has been mentioned already, has to do with, with building renovation. Um, there has been already quite a lot of, of improvements in several sections, uh, sectors, but if we look at the potential that remains, it's clear that the existing building stock is highly inefficient across the EU and it needs to contribute more. So there is an effort both in the revision of the APVD and the revision of the AD to try to put measures in place that would stimulate uh, building renovation. There is also, of course, the, the importance of financing that is highlighted because there is also a need for uh, yeah, really tackling upfront costs. There will always be at least an initial cost so we need to make sure that the public finance that is already available is used uh, as effectively as, as possible. And then as I was mentioning, there is a need, there, there was identified a need to modernize several pieces of legislation because um, our assessment was that uh, different technologies, including ICT, could help us meet our objectives uh, more effectively. So if we then look in, into more detail in, in buildings, uh, the assessment was uh, that both for the EPVD and the AD, what we needed was targeted amendments. So there was an effort to try to preserve the, the core of both directives so that they continue implementing and that from the member state side, implementation efforts are not put on hold waiting for the adoption of the new legislation, their transposition and then their implementation but that uh, the implementation continues uh, in parallel so that we target uh, through um, the proposed amendments just those aspects that are not working as well as they should. So for the, uh, for the EPVD in particular, um, that has to do a lot with um, the need for addressing existing buildings better. The current directive has the target for new buildings, 
but it's weaker in what uh, has to do with existing buildings. And there is also a, a need to update building codes because we have uh, some timid references in the directive to uh, smart technologies, smart metering, intelligent uh, technologies, uh, but very weak. So there was identified the need to really uh, reinforce that aspect, um, but also reinforce it, pu putting a bit the, the uh, user of the building at the, at the center. And then uh, we also um, realize that there is no, uh, there is not a sufficiently a strong link between the legislative measures and the financial measures, which is something that we also try to address. And finally, we also uh, try to improve a, a number of elements in relation to energy performance, but in a way that doesn't reopen uh, cost optimality, because we have um, new provisions, uh, well, new calculations uh, with deadline beginning of 2018, and we don't want to put that again on hold, because then we would uh, limit the achievement of the 2020 objectives, which are uh, still to, to be met. <coughs> So uh, for the APVD, uh, there was in addition an extra focus, which was simplification. Um, there was uh, the need identified uh, within the commission to respond to requests from some stakeholders to try to identify simplification measures. And that together with the um, building renovation and modernization were the three themes of, of the revision. So going a bit in more detail, but without uh, stopping enormously, because in any case you will have the, the slides. Um, the articles that we open uh, are mainly uh, a new article 2A in the APVD, which on the one hand brings Article 4 of the Energy Efficiency Directive of, of national long-term renovation strategies to the APVD, but it also reinforces it, so it adds um, milestones and a clear vision for 2050, because in the EED is open-ended, it talks about long-term, but it doesn't define what we mean. And it also um, includes uh, targeting energy poverty as part of the long-term renovation strategies. And the third uh, element of reinforcement has to do with the financing aspect. So we include a kind of um, template, we can say, of three elements that need to be addressed in relation to financing in each of the national renovation strategies, but without defining the details of how, because it's still the APVD, it's general framework directive, it only defines the minimum requirements, and then it leaves enormous margin for member states to implement, because uh, buildings are really perceived as uh, an issue with uh, very strong subsidiarity concerns by member states, so what the EU can do is limited, so we really um, limit ourselves to the to the uh, to what is needed to be, let's say, harmonised at the level, but leaving a lot of margin for member states to implement. In relation to building renovation, it's important also to mention that Article Seven of the ED on the saving obligation schemes has also uh, proven to be um, a very effective tool in uh, stimulating building renovation. So, in our analysis, we consider that the EPVD, the EED, and then the financing measures should work really in synergy if they are well implemented. In terms of simplification, we identified uh, two main aspects that need to be simplified. On the one hand, for new buildings, the pre-feasibility study, it was identified by member states as an extra burden because it overlaps uh, with the uh, provisions for new buildings to be in early energy buildings and um, inspection of heating and cooling systems was also identified as a, as a potential area for uh, simplification. So in the proposal, we um, include such, uh, such measures for, for these articles. In relation to the, to the smart technologies, there are two main areas. On the one hand, we want to give value to technologies that uh, help the user to control the building better, uh, to make it uh, also more comfortable, to uh, regulate also the operation of the different uh, technical building systems. And therefore, we propose to define a, a smart readiness indicator um, that then would be developed in consultation with the stakeholders. And in fact, we have launched already the process in parallel to the negotiation uh, of, of the proposal because we believe that regardless of the outcome of the negotiation, smart buildings and smart technologies is an area where we really need to, um, to work together with the stakeholders to define how we could value those technologies in, in buildings and those capabilities. 
The other aspect where we uh, propose an extension of the scope of the directive has to do with electromobility. So uh, as part of this package, we try to use each of the pieces of legislation to deliver on uh, the various objectives on, on climate and, and on energy of, of the energy union. And therefore, we try to use buildings and buildings infrastructure as uh, really a, um, a tool to facilitate uh, the development of electromobility so that uh, when a new building is constructed then also a uh, sufficient amount of, of uh, charging points are provided. We also um, look into the aspects that have to do with uh, financial incentives and also on information and there one aspect that links to some of the elements that were uh, introduced before has to do with the disclosure of actual energy consumption and there I, I must say that the negotiation is not looking very positive. I mean we propose it from the Commission side but it is being quite difficult. So we'll see when the file uh, moves more deeply into the Parliament discussion but on the Council side this aspect uh, is extremely difficult. Um, and the other aspects that we try to do is to link uh, much more closely energy performance certificates and financial measures so that on one hand we ensure that renovation measures have the right quality uh, but also that we try to increase the trust into energy performance certificates. The other aspect um, that we uh, try to, to improve through the, through the revision is Annex 1 on the calculation methodology and there, there are two main aspects uh, to take into account. On the one hand, we try to improve the transparency of the calculation methods. Uh, as I said, the, the directive doesn't harmonize the calculation methods. There remain 35 different national and regional calculation methods. But what we hear from investors and what we see also from our own analysis is that we need much more transparency on how uh, energy performance is calculated at national and regional level. So with um, the proposal we uh, would like member states to describe to us uh, according to the EPVD standards how they calculate energy performance without harmonizing, without, the changing, without changing the current methods but asking for a transparent description. The other aspect uh, has to do with uh, better acknowledging aspects that are already in the directive uh, one is the use of renewable energy in, in buildings where again we try to clarify how off-site uh, renewable is, is taken into consideration in the, in the calculation of energy performance and the other aspect has to do with uh, the importance on, on indoor environment and, and ventilation where there is already a reference in Article 4 uh, asking member states to take it appropriately into account and now we include it as well explicitly into Annex 1 where we propose to include it. So just going now into, the, into some of the aspects that I think will be discussed later on, um, I would like to mention a couple of, of elements um, that we consider during the analysis. So as regards non-energy benefits, um, I think that this time uh, within the Commission we really made an effort to quantify these non-energy benefits, uh, both in support of the revision of the ED and of the EPBD because for us it's really the argument to uh, propose ambitious measures and uh, it is also based on that that we um, propose to go for a 30% binding target going beyond what has uh, had been discussed in the, in the European Council a um, couple of years ago. Um, if you want to look into the details of this quantification in the impact assessment supporting the APVD, uh, you can find this in, in Annex 4. Uh, and then the supporting studies have also been published and a similar analysis was also done for the energy efficiency directive. <coughs> then the other aspect that uh, I uh, wanted to mention is that also in the evaluation we recognize that the buildings directive only looks into the operation uh, of, of buildings but that is of course one part of uh, much broader uh, environmental and, and sustainability aspects which are not in the scope for the time being of, of, the, of the EPVD, but the, they are also very important. And uh, as part of the analysis that we included in the impact assessment, we looked into um, some measures such as extending the scope of the cost optimal methodology to include um, additional benefits. 
this was not in the end part of the chosen options um, for several reasons, including to try to let the cost optimal um, cycles work still for 2018. That is very important because it's the last calculation before the 2020 targets and also to gain more knowledge in this area because uh, it's an area where we think that uh, more analysis needs to be, to be carried out, at least from the Commission side. Uh, we don't have sufficient, uh, sufficient knowledge on, on how this could work. The cost optimal methodology is still relatively new. It has only been used once for uh, the calculations that we reported in 2016. And we need more experience with cost optimal, but also more analysis on how we could possibly include the additional benefits. And uh, finally, the other uh, aspect that we um, have included is not only the proposal in Article 10 to include actual energy uh, data, but also the inclusion of, of uh, comfort aspects into, into Annex 1. So before concluding, I would just like to mention that indeed in parallel to the revision, we keep working on, on implementation. We try to use as much as possible uh, the recently adopted uh, standards because we think that this a step in the right direction on of uh, really getting a better understanding of how um, buildings performance is, is calculated and is something that the investors always tell us that they need a better understanding of how different systems work. And then I would also like to mention that as part of, of the big package, we have also published a, a document on good practices that uh, we think is not getting a lot of attention, but is something on which we want to build now in our additional implementation work, uh, including with the concerted action where we are uh, focusing on, on uh, the next, let's say, milestones of the current directive being the, the monitoring of, of the nearly zero energy building targets, the new cost optimal calculations, but also on energy performance certification. We are trying to work with the member states to get to a more comparable quality of EPC schemes across member states because in some of the member states they are relatively new systems, there are no good uh, enforcement mechanisms uh, in place and that is something that we think that can be really reinforced through better implementation. So yeah, from my end I think that's it. So thank you very much and of course I don't know if you want to take the questions now or later. Thank you.